Hey podcast, uh, today we get a special treat. We're going to get to hear all about the uh, parking industry as seen through the eyes of a property manager. One that knows quite a bit about parking, but still, through the eyes of a property manager. Hope you enjoy. I'm Lester Mascot, and this is Park Rex, and today we're sitting with Susan Siren, Senior Property Manager for Boston Properties. Hello. How are you? I'm very, very well. <laughs> very well. I'm not yet drunk. I know it sounds like it, but not yet. We are at a trade show, so it'll happen at some <laughs> it's point. It's going to happen eventually. It's bound to happen. <laughs> Every, my phone's blowing up. Everybody's like, come to the party. I'm like, oh, I'll be there. <laughs> well, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for asking. It's, yeah, it's, I'm delighted yeah. to be here. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so you're you, you're in, obviously in property management. How long have you been? How long have you been doing that? <sighs> or how, how did it start? How, how did all of a sudden end up that you're accidentally? Accidentally. Yeah, I think that's true of most property managers. Really, it's it, everybody sort of backs their way into it. Um, and I went to school to study philosophy. Okay. Um, and so when I graduated, That's an interesting segue there. Right? I know. Well, way. although side note, okay, it's philosophy the most applicable degree that exists. <laughs> Give it a plug. Go ahead. I can do anything. <laughs> study philosophy, kids. It's not too late to save the world. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of took a hiatus um, after college, and I was temping all the way through college in this one firm that I had worked for, it was a real estate investor slash owner slash property management firm. <clears throat> they invited me to come back and just kind of work a receptionist job. And that just kind of, you know, one thing How led to another. Point? I was fresh out of college, so I was probably 21. Okay. Um, and had done some temp work for a lot of real estate firms. Real estate and development is really big in DC and that's you know where I'm from. So most of the temp gigs I got ended up being either financial firms or real estate. Okay. So I had a lot of exposure there. Um, but yeah, it wasn't my plan you know, to get into real estate. I mean, I was kind of like a bleeding heart, like I want to save the world, but it was a really convenient, um, and I was good at it. It turned out I had a knack for it. So it just sort of you know, evolved. And I, I worked for a property management company for a third party owner for a while. And then I went to do facilities management for a biotech. Um, which was crazy. Um, it was actually, have you ever heard of the Human Genome Project? Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I worked for Solera Genomics, which was the private um, the private company that was in that race with NIH. Okay. Like, we sequenced the genome in 2001. Um, and, well, I mean, not me personally, but I... I let it happen. You were in the room. Right? I was. I let it happen. <laughs> I like here's. I constructed your labs, and I, nice. you know, I I did like a lot of the real estate facilities planning for that. Um, and it was an awesome experience. And then it it kind of, it just hit the wall there. And so I kind of for the first time ever like went and like intentionally looked for a job. Um, and I ended up doing asset management for a little while, and I hated it. Um, it was just very cold and very, it was all financial modeling, which is great. I love financial modeling, but not in entirety, right? It's just, it gets really monotonous after a while. And it's also not for nothing. I know you said not to cuss, but it's kind of douchey, yeah. that sector. You know what I mean? It's just all real, like leasing brokers that are really excited to make money and they don't care as much about, you know, a goal or a mission. Kind of managing it all from a spreadsheet. Yeah, exactly. So I left. I quit that job. That was the first job I ever quit. And I left. Like I walked out, <laughs> <laughs> which is not a thing I do. Um, and so I, that's how I ended up finding Boston Properties, like quite by accident. Um, so I've been with them for, it'll be 16 years in wow. July. That's a long time. I know, right? <laughs> you must like it. I do like it. Yeah, it's a good place to work. But moreover, it's, um, I have never been bored. You know? That's cool. I mean, one thing is that property management is just a really diverse, you know, kind of discipline. But moreover, the, the culture of my company is such that if I want to do something and I'm interested in something or I'm curious about something, I'll just kind of ask to get in on it. And no one ever has been like, but that's not your expertise. <laughs> you know, they're just like, well, sure, take a crack at it. And, I, you know, sometimes it's great and I do well and sometimes it fizzles and I don't do well. And, you know, it's just sort of evolved that way. And that's actually how I came to parking um, because my boss, 
<clears throat> um, who is the head of our property management division in the Washington, D.C. region. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a lot of focus on parking and some of her previous expertise, like with other companies. And when we came, when she came over, parking was really more considered just kind of amenity. It was sort of just like attached to the building, but we really like didn't. something you had to do. Mm -hmm. And also something that we didn't give a lot of thought to because we were either, most of our garages were either leased or if they were managed garages, we were just letting the operators kind of handle it and we'd just accept the checks and be grateful for it. But over time, you know, A, she knew well, how much money was being left on the table. And over time, our senior leadership started to tune in on it because we started seeing greater shares of revenue at some of our other locations, like elsewhere in the country. Like, for example, we have the Prudential Center in Boston, which okay. is a massive, I mean, it's, you know, the Prudential Center, it's yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're making bank up there. I mean, they're making, you know, a pretty significant uh, cut of revenue up there. And I think they were sort of looking at DC and going, hmm. I'd be able to do better here. <laughs> like, what, it's not proportionate, right? Percentage wise, like we're not doing as well there as we're doing, you know, at, at Embarcadero in San Francisco or in the Peru in Boston. So, so how much of the focus really is on, is on the parking revenue? Are you there's a balance there, right? Because, I mean, the ultimate goal really is square footage, Absolutely. leasing square footage, right? Yeah. I mean, when we're thinking about parking, um, most of the time we're thinking still about amenity parking. But there's a revenue sector now that's attached to it. And so where we might offset that for marketing purposes are concessions like, um, you know, a period of, of free parking or, um, free, you know, complimentary validations or, um, you know, a nested area, things that accommodate a tenant's need. Like, no offense, but the things the leasing departments came up with around parking drives me nuts. Because it's like a different a different uh, arrangement on every single one. So you end up having like, okay, how tight do you want to hold to those rules? Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I've had, um, I tend to be, I'll, I'll admit it openly, I tend to be a little mercenary about parking because it's a fact of life that people are so accustomed to. Nobody gripes. I mean, rest in town center aside, that's its whole other like political thing. There's That's just all griping. But Well, it's not like 10 of the improvements where it's a one-time cost no. and you're done. It's an ongoing exactly. giveaway. It, right? it's, a, it's an operating model. And it also sets the tone for what the customer experience is. Because again, in the past, we're looking at garages as these just sort of separate blobs that are sort of attached to the building. And mm -hmm. we don't really, you know, we didn't ideologically think of them as a part of the building. And that's just ideologically, a, a, you know, an evolution that we've tried to instill in our teams that my boss, you know, kind of pushed forward that you need to be thinking about these garages as part of your building. The customer service experience should be uniform right both in the garage and in the building it's another product that you have available to you that uh yeah and if our and gold star service is kind of the name of the game for us so the, well, I mean, the parking can, should be no different and when you can generate revenue from it it helps you provide that higher level of service <laughs> too right? yeah well it depends on who you talk to because yeah. you know i mean <laughs> it, you sure except that if it's you know taking a cut from you know the take home then you sure. know from the net then it's it's less attractive to to those that um care about the bottom line in the immediate sense like if you're looking at it in short-term gain sure. um, which and those people are out there I mean they exist I mean I, I you know no not to like name names or what have you but I you know there are people in my organization who are like customer service is not my priority make that <laughs> money and I and I'm like yeah, oh, praise you know I'll, I'll do it if I can um, but again, I, you know from a property management point of view that's a pretty fine line to walk is where you're trying to you know, get the cash, but keep the tenants happy and not provoke them into a situation where the parking situation becomes something where when they're starting to think about renewals, they're like, yeah, but the parking here is like yeah. super expensive and you've been totally unaccommodating or, you know, whatever that might be. We don't want that to be a, like a variable in their equation. The last thing you want is for the parking to make you lose revenue on square footage. A hundred percent, which that's what I try to keep in mind when there are leasing or development decisions mm -hmm. made relative to the operating model. Um, you know, as an example, there we have a building in DC where there, it, the, m most of the garage, like two thirds of the garage is a nest um, for an anchor tenant in the building. And they have, they wanted all of their visitors, it's LPR core, um, and they wanted all of their visitors to park in their nest and initially I was like, that's fine. Like we can totally work that and we can just build you for validations and arrears. And then the, our development leasing reps were like, actually, we're gonna amend the lease and just give them all their validations for free. And they're churning in and out so many people. And initially I was like, what? 
that's like that's so much money you're leaving on the table for no reason they never asked for it they never i mean i was in the room they never expressed any like you know this would be a lot easier if we didn't have to pay like we, they just gave it to them and and so initially i was like that's stupid like why would you do that but thinking about it in a broader sense you know that really made an impact on them that we're doing everything that we can to accommodate their goals and their needs and make that arrival experience how much of the building were they leasing most of it oh well. again anchor they're, they're like 80 percent of the okay. building and again two-thirds of the garage so sure. I, I mean and again i'm not gonna argue the direction if you give me a mandate i mean I'm a soldier, you know, mine is not to reason why mine is but to do or die. <laughs> so you tell me how you want it done. I'll get it done. But, you know, from my perspective as somebody who has a slightly greater share of experience in the parking world, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would try to give feedback that, OK, yeah, that's fine. But here's the revenue that we're walking away away from. And if that balance is acceptable to them, who am I to argue? Right. I always think you should, if you're going to need to give away something, it's always better to give away those one-time things, not the... Yeah. Because that, that just keeps... That, gi that giveaway it just grows yes, every day. Yes, it does. I know. Every I try not to attach myself to it too much because it's not my money. You know, I think the most important thing I've found when, like, when I, I used to do a lot of system commissioning, when you set things up, it's like, you know what? I don't really care what you want to do. If you want this to be free, it's going to be free. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to report on it for you. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you so data you know. to show you yeah. how much you're giving away. And then that way you can make better decisions. It's one of the reasons why we do performance monitoring at most of our locations. Yeah. So we can eyeball those trends and see if there are things that are happening that, you know, where we are leaving money on the table or if there are enhancements that can be made as a result of trending and, and things like that. So I've, I've found those kind of analytics are absolutely critical for us. You know, I would love to um, I actually keep thinking about writing an article about this. I want to take and have it totally directed at like leasing departments for property management companies mm -hmm. just specifically on how to properly give away parking bless your heart to, just to like go, okay look <laughs> there's only so like the system's only going to be able to deal with so much creativity with like yeah and be able to still have it be automated to right. be able to this giveaway that you want to do and kind of go through like the little tricks on how you can arrange it so yeah hey you want to give two hours away that's fine want to give three hours away fine right but what happens at three hours and five minutes yeah does it go straight back to the original rate yeah i mean we've, <laughs> i've tried to offer feedback to the leasing folks um and as have other managers right mm -hmm. like in property management and so far there hasn't been a lot of reception to it i mean we i come i'm a data hound so i come with charts Show and me. graphs and spreadsheets and you know here's all the information that this is a result of what that decision could be. I saw this thing, uh, this sticker, it said, uh, it was all our little meme or whatever it was. It said, uh, in God we trust, all others must bring data. <laughs> Preach, for <laughs> real. But I mean, unfortunately, in those kinds of marketing discussions, I'm finding more and more that the data isn't leading the way for those discussions. or. If it is, it's not the data that I'm providing. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't want to, um, you know, disparage, you know, people in, in the leasing because they, Look, they have it's different goals and missions. Yeah, it's and, conflicting, uh, mm -hmm. conflicting goals. That's yeah. all it comes down to. I mean, the it makes sense. Square footage is the first thing they want to lease. Absolutely. And they don't want to piss people off. You know, they really, parking is... Uh, in DC, in in a lot of ways, it, and probably everywhere. Oh, but it's precious in DC. It's it's like, and it's such a, it's so emotionally charged. I had to work on the Manulife building, the five 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 twelve. Did you? Yeah, when the half of that half of that place was all leased out to the Manulife. Yeah. Uh, the, or what's the name of the? Anyway, they had their own half of the garage. And you had to go through the first set of equipment to get to the second part of equipment. It was a full nest, okay. and they got all the revenue. Yeah. Oh my God. From that half of the Did garage. Did they own the property? No, they didn't. What the what? Well, Manulife owned it. What was the, it? Was a. So Manulife owned the property, and then there was a big attorney that owned had like half the building. Okay, got it. Who occupied half the building? Who occupied okay, half I was gonna say, building. why are they getting the money? That's like the best contract I know. ever. <laughs> but they had their and they had their own. Like own section of the garage, all yeah. the revenue that went from that section went to them. Yeah, we've seen similar arrangements like that in some of our JVs. Um, we have one that's. And um, guess what? When they owned it, they didn't validate. Huh? The tenant didn't validate. 
for oh, their people. Really? That, yeah, like everybody, okay. paid. Yeah. See? everybody paid. See, everybody pays. The, the employees about? had to pay. Yeah. Everybody paid. I to mean, park it's in just the like building. this. Like going back to that <laughs> other example, like the tenant at no point was like, "We don't want to pay for validations." I mean, all the conversations I'd had with them, they were fully expecting it. That was the culture that they'd come from, from the building sure. that they were in previously. Like there were no surprises there. So I was just like, "Why are we putting this out there?" It's always an interesting dynamic with Class A office space because when you actually look at the dollars that are or uh, they're actually coming through the equipment as short-term revenue. Yeah. It's so minor. Yeah, no. You get like 95% of the transactions are validated. It's And it's certainly dwarfed in comparison to rent. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and operating, you know, reconciliation. So it's, you know, I, I get it. Again, I don't I don't pretend or, you know, I have no pretense of saying like, well, I could lease this better. You know, certainly <laughs> not. Like I could do a but million things, I would but say, leasing is not one But of validation them. revenue is the hardest thing to manage. It is. I agree with that. Especially when you have an older system where you're producing like chaser tickets. Yes. And now you've got like, you're basically handing over cash. Yeah. But there again, if you can supply the infrastructure that provides you with the data, then you have a better place to start from. So it just sucks when the tenant doesn't have to pay for those validations yes. and they get unlimited as many as they want right. or something. But and again, you still have the capacity to track it, to sure. know, to understand what that movement looks like and to be able to, as you said, kind of come to the table to you know, when their lease is up or, you know, whatever, and say, look, we we have walked away from, you know, a quarter million dollars over the last five years or whatever it could be. That's persuasive to, to some people. Yeah. And But then again, on the other hand, if they're looking at a 10-year re renewal and the tenant is like, we'd never paid for validation in the existing term, why would we in the yeah. new term? Then, no, then they're going to, <laughs> yeah, then they're going to go forget about it. And like, we're not going <coughs> to, you know, just start now all of a sudden, you know. So again, it, there's this there's this balance that you have to strive for, and I think that having the ability to collect data um, and to be able to look at that data in a multitude of facets, like you know, from a number of different angles, and kind of understand like what those patterns and trends are. Again, it's why we do performance monitoring, which is really helpful at um, our some of our garages with older equipment. Um, so the the system may not have the ability to um, be able to provide you with you know detailed occupancy data or you know things like that but performance monitoring is a program that really does allow you to sort of you know collect that data look at it in in a a pretty specific way to kind of you know cut out sure. sections that you can drill down to and kind of understand origins and things like that what are your thoughts on parking guidance i am not a fan um, except for where it provides ancillary value. So, for example, we use it in our Reston Town Center location, but the only reason that it's there is because they contain the sensors that actually house the LPR sure. componentry. Yep. Um, for guidance in general, I, I just don't see value for cost. In, at least in our applications, you know, if it's a shop, a huge shopping mall or an airport, I can see there being, you know, a much, mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to BWI, right, years in, ago, like after they installed that oh, system. The Christmas oh, installed. my God. I was like, oh, especially with that crazy, like spirally thing that have you ever been over there? I have. I remember the old system that was there. Yeah. So and it, it literally looked like a rednecks trailer <laughs> with like Christmas. Like it, it, it looped, right? It, it drooped. <laughs> So classy. Yeah. So that in really inspires confidence <laughs> when you're about to like. Well, get I think on they an followed the ceiling. Yeah. And it just the ceiling was like that, and they made all the things the same. So it just didn't. It wasn't straight. I don't know. Uh, so, I I didn't notice that. No offense I, uh, to whoever it? did it, but I as you like off to me was like, oh geez, it's like my Christmas lights. It really did. Not but just because they were lit. It was impactful <laughs> though. I mean, it's visually impactful given the scale and the magnitude of that yeah. garage. You know, so. do, you, do you feel like you've ever been in one that's been done really well? I, I'll be honest, that one I felt like was really... It's really less... It's really this kind of... And, and So I've done a lot of them. I probably... Yeah, my standards are clearly way lower than yours. Well, you know, I've, I've, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've probably pretty. been involved in installing like over 100,000 spaces of it at this point. And what really makes it live and breathe is the signs. Yeah. It almost has nothing to do with the lights yes. over the stalls. No, the, 100%. The, the lights over the stalls are the, are the last indicator. So... You know, and, and not giving too much data and covering yeah. every single one of those decision points when yeah. you really have that, okay, am I going to go in this garage or not? I, one number at the Way front of the garage. Wayfinding is essential. I that's mean, what really makes you yeah. could You could do ultrasonic with no lights and just have the wayfinding signs. Yes, I and agree. I, I think that's how it should be done. 
Um, cause I just don't see the value. To you'd, have, you'd have a better experience than if you just had the lights over the stalls and no signs. Yeah. I mean, that's how important the signs yes, are. Yes, agreed. That. Yeah. But again, I just don't. Plus it, it it's, um, aesthetically, I, the, I find it. It's cluttery when it's yes, out of that. cluttery. That's can. a good way to put it. It just, it's like, there's just so much like stuff mm. going on visually in that space that it, it almost defeats its purpose. But the, the level signage is where I'm like, I loved that. You know, when you're going to BWI and you're going up that crazy spiral ramp and every many, floor yeah. there, I'm like, I loved that. It was, it just allowed for so much more efficient movement through that structure. I remember going to uh, DFW. If you've ever been there, there's I literally have. acres. They're, they're like huge. Yeah, they have a ton of represent parking. representation here. Yeah, they're they're they've won like every airport award and really? stuff like that. Well, yeah, good for you, Dallas Fort Worth. I know they're Way doing a go. good job. Yeah, congrats. <laughs> but there's literally acres of indoor parking. Like you stand in like the middle of there and you look around and it's just like, wow. like you're like. <laughs> I mean, you can hold like a like a NASCAR race inside one of those <laughs> like garages. A jungle. Yeah, it's crazy. There's gonna be like Galapagos, like small like sectors of evolution happening. <laughs> <laughs> like cars morphing into dinosaurs. Uh, so, yeah, that would be one really minute. cool, though. Come on. We haven't even started having any drink after the show. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, I mean, if they didn't have some guidance of some sort, there'd be whole sections of that garage that people would never even park in. Yeah. Like they never even go there. Yeah. Like, you didn't know to go around that corner, and there was another 100 spaces back there because it was so big. Wow. So I think it does improve. Um, Is it used? I mean, a, a, do they ever get to capacity? Like, I don't know specifically about that facility, but they do get pretty full there. Um, but I don't. I can't tell you what the stats are on it. But, interesting. Uh, I like guidance. Yeah. Oh, do you? I like guidance a lot. Do you really? I really do. I don't think the camera-based guidance is worth the money you spend because 90% of why you buy a guidance system is really more about the wayfinding. Yes. So I would always lean towards however I can get that done the least expensive because yes. that's all I really want to provide. Right. Everything else seems overcomplicated, full of exceptions. Superfluous. Yeah. It's just like, okay, well, that worked kind of. Yeah. It didn't do exactly how I wanted it done. Yeah. In the ultrasonic and other systems, I mean, they just they just get it done at like almost hundred percent. Right. Well, and again, I think there are applications for your product. Too. It, it makes great sense to do it, right? Yeah. Like if you're like uh, the Prudential Center is a really good example of that. Just kind of thinking within my own sort of ecosystem because it's you know multiple buildings with one garage structure underneath that's you know kind of unified and and so to the extent that there's all these different egress points. Um, I, you know, and depending on where you're trying to get to, because it's a shopping center as well sure. as office, I think that that's a really good environment where that kind of technology would work reliably well and be genuinely beneficial I versus, say, Reston Town Center, eh, rather less so. You know, I think anywhere we can reduce friction in the Agreed. parking environment yes. is beneficial. I agree 100%. That's why I love LPR. Me too. I, and, I think LPR really made a turn when they stopped. You, LPR used to only go in parking when it was an airport. Mm -hmm. And it was only about protecting and playing defense on right. revenue. Right, like uh, toll roads. Yeah. Like it was the same sort of application there. And they, they were actually matching tickets. So when you pulled in, they wanted to make sure that you didn't swap your ticket yep. well, before you, know, you went. This is related but not because, I mean, I often think about speed traps, like mm -hmm. um, speed cameras, traffic cameras, um, and toll cameras. But the speed cameras in particular, and I've talked to a couple different law enforcement people, and they use LPR for those applications. Yep. But they 100% of the time have a human being correlate the data and, and issue the citation versus having an algorithmic process, which is what we're trying to do in the parking industry, right? Like we can't, there's literally no actual way within Reston Town Center, for example, that a person could go through and kind of like verify all those transactions. It's yeah. lunacy. There's no way that could happen. Um, I like, I, so I, I've talked to a few people about this and especially in a private environment, as much as I am attracted to wanting to come up with the full ticket list and gate list and all those things, like I really think that would be cool. It just there's a certain level of accepting the conditions of pulling into a facility when you have to pass through a gate. True, but then there are also conditions where a gate is going to completely destroy your operation. Yeah. Um, and that was the problem that we faced within in Reston Town Center. And I know I keep sort of coming back to that, but it's the most like sort of you know quote unquote problematic. Um, environment that we had and so because of its location just as an example um, I don't mind gate 
I don't mind gated systems like at all, especially when they work well, right? It's a, it's an excellent you know kind of processing point um, to keep things fluid and to make sure that you're capturing as much of the revenue as possible. So you know, yay for gates. But in this scenario, for example, the location of the real estate is so placed centrally from like a, a bunch of major intersections of like huge thoroughfare roads mm-hmm. that. It, and it's like, you know, you get off one major interstate onto a huge sort of through lane and then there's like a short street and the garage. So if you put gates in that situation at a in the, within that environment, what you have is these massive waves of traffic at various points oh, during the day. So morning and evening because it's predominantly office <coughs> out there. So. You know, given the lo- the location and the proximity to those, and feeders, there wasn't gates there prior. Right? No, and they weren't designed to take gates. Like there are no islands yeah. there. There's no infrastructure. Like there's no conduit. You so know, that's actually a really brilliant idea there. That if I can get ninety percent or eighty percent of my revenue that I'm yes. supposed to, and I can leave it in the condition it's in and not cause all these traffic related issues, that's a huge win. It, it was, we had to, and it was frankly the reason why, um, you know, we had to patch together um, an ecosystem from multiple platforms that were gonna interface, um, right? So we have one for sort of the camera core and another for the mobility and payment and citation, and then another one for, you know, like pay on foot and another one for, uh, well, we had another one for validation at one point that that kind of, you know fizzed out i mean so there's all these different pieces that are and because there was nothing out there that could service all of the need um in terms of you were definitely first out of the plane on a lot of things on that one on that one yeah absolutely i mean it's weird because i mean in most cases i mean we're we're a pretty conservative outfit like we tend not to go bleeding edge like we tend not to take a lot of risk um with technology we that's not to say that we're luddite you know we're not afraid of the technology but the parking sector is probably the first and only place that i can think of except maybe for mechanicals like mechanical systems we tend to be a little more you know, forward thinking. Um, but with regard to like structurals and, you know, construction sure. and things like that, we tend to be like super conservative. Other technology Everybody wait, waits a week to apply their iPhone update. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad advice. <laughs> I hope not. I hope they're not doing that. But I mean, yeah, we don't like it. Um, when I first joined the company, um, it took. I want to say a good five years before they agreed to give out Blackberries Uh-oh. to managers. Like I had my own cell phone, but the company wouldn't issue me a phone. And it took a lot of work to convince our senior leadership that this was actually, you know, a, a technology that was beneficial to the business. Well, you get your employees working 24 right. 7. I mean that's really it's true. I remember having that discussion it was like everyone one of the one of the people I worked for was like we're not giving away iPhones nobody gets an iPhone nobody gets this <laughs> like that and uh then there was this whole discussion where we were uh someone he'd spoken to us like you know what I'm gonna give them the coolest shit I can find the most badass laptop I'm sorry I'm almost swearing <laughs> Um, oh, it's your podcast. I know. I'm going to give them the nicest laptops. <laughs> as long as I'm good, side. that's really what matters. <laughs> I thought I was doing the whiskey one for a minute. Um, but I'm going to give them the nicest laptops, and I'm going to give them tablets and the nicest phones, and then they're just going to be on them all the time. Yeah. And I'll get a little extra. Yeah, though, the flip side of that is it gives a degree of freedom that we never had before. Yeah. You know, it didn't have to be chained to a desk. Like, for example, if not for the ability to – you know, have mobile technology, this job that I'm doing now wouldn't have happened because my job is now, like I, I'm technically in property management. I have now only three assets that I oversee. I have three managers, you know, within those assets, but I oversee most of our parking operations, parking operations through the DC region. Um, and I wouldn't be able to do that if not for that. Are there other people in analogous positions in mm-hmm. other parts of the country? It's like you mentioned San Francisco, like in Barcadero. No. Okay. I don't think so. If there are, they haven't told me about it. I mean, I've interfaced a little bit with um, some of our other regions, Boston and San Francisco notably, because I've at this point done so many equipment bids and and sort of, you know, vetting new providers and vetting new technologies and trying to understand like where those applications, if they can be applied in, you know, what we're doing. Um, And so other markets have reached out to me um, to kind of work with them on developing scope or talking about vendors that have come to them or, or things like that. So I've 
operated in a little bit of a consulting capacity in a limited way. Um, it's my hope, frankly, that I could expand that and I could be sort of our national, you know, Very parking cool. dude. That would be cool. I would be really happy to do that, but they haven't asked me yet. So yeah. hopefully soon. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Well, hey, thank you very, very much it's my for pleasure. coming on the show. It's been great. It was a lot of fun. Thank you again for inviting me. This was really cool. I've never done anything like this before. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you on again soon. Please do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Having a great time doing this. If, uh, if you're enjoying it, if you're getting value from it, please leave some feedback. Please subscribe. There's a lot of people listening, not as many subscribers. So if uh, you could subscribe, comment. And share it. Please share it with your friends. Share it with your family. Tell your mom. Tell your dad. Tell everyone. Thanks.